Okay, Baratunde here with another video op-ed. This time I'm sharing some knowledge gleaned from a white paper at Harvard University. I don't have kids, so I have time to read white papers. This is part of my live on lockdown series. Click the link in my bio to find out more and to access this paper for yourself. So the title of this paper is When Can We Go Out? Evaluating Policy Paradigms for Responding to the COVID-19 Threat published by the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. A friend sent me this a week ago. I got around to it. I loved it. And I've been trying to figure out a way to communicate its essence to you without reading the whole paper at you. So here goes. In under 10 minutes, I'm going to break down what these academics have to say. Two broad points in this paper, how we got into this mess as the U.S. and the best way to get out. So let me start with how we got into this. You may have heard about the failures of our ability, uh, not ability, but our failures to execute on a plan to prepare for this pandemic. And it's true. The current president walked into the White House very arrogant, very ignorant, saw anything a previous president had done, like a pandemic preparedness playbook, and lit that joint on fire, deciding he would go with his gut over science. And a lot of us are paying the price, and some people, sadly, have perished unnecessarily because of the delay. But it's not just that. It turns out that the U.S. pandemic preparedness has always been about influenza. And this is a coronavirus, which is very different attributes. This is more infectious. This is more deadly. This is not seasonal in the same way that the flu is. At least we don't expect that it will be. And most importantly, there's no vaccine. A lot of these other pandemic preparation plans assume the existence of a vaccine. We don't have that. So the authors of this paper basically say this is like not paying attention to Al-Qaeda right before 9-11. I would say it's like not paying attention to ISIS because you're still focused on Al-Qaeda. Either way, our attention was directed in the wrong direction. Didn't have to be this way. Turns out other nations are like a parallel universe where we can see a different reality play out. And the authors focus on Taiwan, which has experience with SARS prior to this and has updated their society to be able to deal with it. There are thermal temperature scanners at malls and office places. When you board a public transit vehicle, you scan your cell phone with a QR code. That gives the government the ability to notify everybody on that train car if any one of them pops up as infected with something. We don't have that going on in the U.S., at least not yet, but we could. So that takes me to the meat of the paper. When can we go out? We're seeing a lot of nonsense, a lot of irresponsible behavior. People protesting in North Carolina as I record this for their right to infect each other and kill their grandparents. And, you know, we are a free society. You're free to be a fool if you want. But it turns out there's a smarter way. So this group lays out three ways that we might get out. The first, freeze in place. The second, mobilize in transition. That's the recommended one. Spoiler alert. The third, surrender which is not good. No bueno, no surrender. I'll explain that at the very end. So freeze in place is really just about protecting the healthcare system. And it's what we've been focused on so much right now, flattening the curve, allowing our, our, those frontline health workers, those limited resources of equipment and ICU beds not to be overrun by a spike in cases. So the good news is it does reduce the ability of the virus to infect massive numbers of people. The bad news is it doesn't actually get us to the other side and it freezes the economy in place. And for it to be effective requires multiple rounds of this extreme distancing. They're saying two to four rounds of this, two months on, one month off, something like that, adding up to a year to a year and a half of this stasis, which is not good. 10 to $15 trillion later, we could be on the other side. But there's another way forward, the mobilize and transition plan. And this takes as the metaphor wartime. You see a threat to your healthcare system as an existential threat, as a national security threat. So you get on that war footing and you mobilize your entire society. You're still doing what freeze in place calls for, especially initially, an initial quarantine period to buy you time to make investments to fight the next round of the pandemic or future pandemics. This is where we finally get to infrastructure week. Ding, ding, ding. We finally get to have Infrastructure Week. I'm so, I've been really looking forward to Infrastructure Week ever since they first announced. I'm like, that's the week. That's the week America's going to like 
you know, clean up our filthy bridges and fix that stuff. So in this case, infrastructure means the ability to do wide scale testing, the ability to have um, lo uh, more localized treatment in terms of isolating people and the ability to reactivate parts of our society with the knowledge of who's infected and who's not. Most interestingly, if we get to the point where we understand how immunity might work in this, then we can deploy those people with immunity on the front lines. The paper actually calls for a medical reserve corps where those people are in charge of the contact tracing and the following up and helping with the isolation and doing some of those frontline jobs, those essential work jobs that we need done, but now with the knowledge of who can do it without endangering the rest of us. They even propose employing prisoners in the process, not taking advantage of them for two cents an hour or whatever we do in our barbaric modern society, but paying folks at least a living wage. The advantage of this mobilize and transition path is that we get the whole society engaged in being part of the solution to this problem. This is exciting because a lot of us are stuck at home or whatever passes for home feeling very useless. But if we were able to return to school, return to work, know that we're going to get our temperature checked every day, that we're going to get tested every week, we can be a part of that solution and we can deploy the strongest of us to, to be out back in society as we still hunt for the vaccine, which is really the only way we fully return to normal, even though normal wasn't that great. And there's a lot of big structural change we still need to get about. But that's another video. The last path, which is very much not recommended, is surrender. Now, surrender says let the virus run its course and have its way with your people. In the U.S., that looks like two million dead. And some folks arguing from a purely economic standpoint think that that's OK. But it turns out a bunch of dead bodies still cost a lot of real money. And we're talking 10 to 20 trillion dollars for this path versus 10 to 15 trillion for freeze in place. And I forgot to mention two to three trillion for mobilizing transition. But the reason you don't do the surrender thing isn't just because of math. You do it because of the whole purpose of government and having a society in the first place. Not just the morality, but the idea that the reason we have these United States and many countries exist in the first place is to provide for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's to have the common defense and look out for the general welfare. And, and a company, not a company, that's, that's an oligarchic slip of the tongue for our plutocracy, a country and a government which intentionally lets millions of its citizens die has lost its legitimacy. As the paper says, to do that is to forfeit the very reason you have a state in the first place. So that's not good economically, it's not good morally, but it would delegitimize our entire political system. Now maybe there's some psychos like Steve Bannon who were down with that sort of deconstruction of the administrative state, but your boy's not one of them. I like an administrative state. I like my fellow country people alive and well. And we're all connected anyway. So letting 2 million people die is going to affect all of us. Mobilize and transition. That's the path. You can find more of this paper at ethics.harvard.edu. I don't work for them. I was just really thrilled to read this document. And I've been trying to share the insights where I can. So right now, that means with you. This is Baratunde Thurston, live on lockdown video op-ed update. Check the link in my bio for full access to this paper, plus my past interviews with state senators, with people in the countryside of France, with the artist JR, and a lot more people coming up. I do a live show on Instagram every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, at Baratunde. And if you're still watching, yo, why don't you text me? I got a text number just for you, 202-894-8844. I'll wish you a happy birthday and a whole lot more. Peace.